this is going to be another episode of God's Game of Thrones. We're going through looking at all these kings of Israel and Judah. And we're seeing some really interesting stories along the way. Stories about Elijah and Elisha, the great prophets of the Old Testament. And now we come to another story about Elijah and a mighty man named Naaman. So look at 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. This man Naaman was a great man with his master, a great man. And Job 32, 9 says, Great men are not always wise. Neither do the age understand judgment. Naaman was a great man, a great captain, but he was lacking in many other ways. This man is the one the Lord used to give deliverance to Syria. This mighty man, he's a, he's a mighty man, but mighty men aren't all mighty. In Revelation 6.15, the mighty men are so pale in comparison to Jesus Christ that they go to hide in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And this man Naaman, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given great del given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. This man Naaman, he's got a lot going for him, but, but, he was a leper. You might have a lot going for you, but you are still a sinner, and if you're not saved, then you're a sinner in the hands of an angry God. God may have used you or done something through you as he did Naaman, but if you're not saved, then the wrath of God abideth on you. It says in 2 Kings 5, 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So they go and they capture this little woman, this little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Notice this is a little maid. This little maid has a lot more sense than the mighty man of valor. She's just a little maid, though. Do you know what God uses? Little things. It says in Proverbs 16, 8, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. God is looking for little people. Even if you're six foot six, you can still be little in your own mind because we are all little when compared to God. This was just a little captive maid, but she knew about the God of her father. She knew about his prophets. It says in verse 3, And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of this leprosy. This little maid had big faith. She knew that if Elisha, the prophet, came in contact with Naaman, the mighty leper, that he would be recovered. And Elijah is a great type of Jesus Christ, who also cleanses lepers. You'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ also cleanses lepers in the Gospels. It says in Second Kings 5, 4 through 6, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is coming to thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. For some reason, the king of Syria thinks that this is a matter that the king of Israel can handle. Kings have a lot of authority, but Elijah is the one with all the power. So he, the king of Syria, he's, he's uh, going to the king of Israel for help, saying, you know, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. The king of Israel obviously can't heal a leper. He has no idea why he sent this leper to him. 
He thinks the guy must be crazy or trying to start something with him. He thinks he's trying to start a quarrel with him. You see, Israel has the knowledge of God. They know that only God can heal. The king of Syria is a heathen and has no idea about spiritual things. It says in 2 Kings 5, 8, And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had, sent it, had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Elijah heard about it. I don't know if he read about it in the paper, seen it on the news, or if there was just a bunch of gossip in town, but he sent to the king telling him to send him this Naaman the leper. Since Elijah pictures Jesus Christ, this should remind you that you can't fix a sinner. No more than the king of Israel could fix a leper. So you need to send him to Jesus Christ. Uh, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Notice he came with his horses and chariot. And being a mighty captain of a host, he is used, he's used to having his trust in horses. Psalm 20 and verse 7, some trust in horses, some, some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some people have their trust in their own strength, their own works, and have never just come to Jesus Christ as a sinner who needs saving. Now verse 10, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. It's a simple instruction. All Naaman has to do is get down in the water and wash seven times and he'll be clean. A very simple instruction. It's a simple instruction when it comes to salvation. You come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner, put your trust on him to save you, believe on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. We're saved by grace through faith in his blood. Put your faith in the blood, you'll be clean. Very simple. But it says in verse 11, but Naaman was wroth. And went away and said, Behold, I thought, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Notice Naaman says, I thought. Don't think too much. Just believe. Just believe. Come to God as a child and believing and do it without question. Maybe Elijah didn't come out to Naaman to see him because he didn't want to boost his ego anymore. He didn't want his head to get any bigger than it already already was. So Elijah didn't even come out to meet him. Elijah knows that a man needs to be humbled before he can be helped. Remember when you got saved, how humbled you were? You realized you couldn't save yourself and you turned to Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Kings 5.12, Naaman says, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman pictures a sinner who thinks that he knows a better way. He's like, Abana and Farpar are much better rivers. Never think that you have a better way. You come God's way or you don't come. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As he says in John 10, 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way the same as a thief and a robber Naaman thinks he's got a better way if he knew so much why didn't he just take care of it himself you have people who don't want to go god's way so what do they do in romans 10 3 for they being ignorant of god's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of god so he walks away in a rage and many times a sinner first hears a preacher who has god's message and he will walk away in anger, but then it will work on his heart. It says in Second Kings 5.13, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. You know, they're saying, you know, if he told you to do some big mission or journey to be healed, you would have done it. But since he told you something so simple, you're not going to do it. But just go God's way. You today, if you're listening to this, just go God's way. Go the blood of the Jesus, of Jesus Christ way. Wash and be clean. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says we are washed. When does that happen? At water baptism? 
No. What happens the moment we believe the gospel. Naaman's servants have more sense than he has. They are saying that if Elijah told him to go and do some great thing to be recovered of his leprosy, then he would have done it with no questions asked. But this pictures a sinner's desire to work his way to heaven, to have something to do with their salvation. So Naaman finally realizes there's nothing he can do other than what the preacher said, wash and be clean. So Naaman listened to someone who was lesser esteemed than him. Sometimes that's good for you. In 2 Kings 5.14, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He listened to Elijah, and his flesh was like a little child again. He was clean. When you believe on Jesus Christ, your soul becomes more innocent than a little child. It gets washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're clean. This pictures the new birth. He came up out of that water as a little child. When you got saved, you got born again. You are born into the family of God, and you are a child of God. You know what John calls us in the, his little epistles? He calls us little children. In 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then it says, Naaman, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Now Naaman knows something. You see, you can say he has assurance and that he's fully persuaded. First John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. Just like when you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in, and you knew that no other gods could satisfy. This is what leads men to turn to God from idols. Now don't get it twisted. Turning from idols isn't what saves you, and turning from idols doesn't prove you're saved, but there are things a Christian should do, and turning from other gods is one of them. Naaman wants Elijah to take something from him out of appreciation for what he did. It says in verse 16, But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Since Elijah is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, this could picture how he won't take anything for your salvation. And even after you're clean, he won't take anything to allow you to keep your salvation. He keeps it for you. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules, burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Just like when you get saved, you need to quit sacrificing yourself to the world and sacrifice for the Lord. Put your time on the altar and give it to him. I think one of the greatest things you can do is give the Lord your time. You only have so much sand in the hourglass. And when you give time to the Lord, you're giving those grains of sand back to him. You could have been playing video games with it. You could have been watching movies with it or bowling or hunting or fishing. But you sacrificed all that and you gave your time to God. I believe that pleases God. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when thy, my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. You see, when you get saved, you start thinking about the places you're going and the people you are around. Naaman is saying that he has to go into the houses of worship of these false gods. As that's his job. He has to go in. He's not going to bow down to those false gods now. Sometimes as a Christian, you have to go in places where wicked stuff is going on. Just because you have to work alongside sodomites and dirty language doesn't mean you agree with it any more than Naaman would agree with those false gods. And you know you're not supposed to company with fornicators, but look how Paul further explains it in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must need ye go out of the world. He said, yet not altogether. If you had to completely separate, then you couldn't be in this world anymore, or even function in the world. You must needs go out of the world if you couldn't be around these people, period. You see, Naaman wouldn't be able to get away from certain men, but he didn't have to entertain their sin. It says in verse 19, He said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. 
So Gehazi didn't like the fact that Elijah didn't take something from Naaman. He didn't take the love offering from Naaman, so he's going to run after him real quick, run after him quicker than the televangelist who needs a new private jet and get something from him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is it is all well? By the way, some TV preachers need money. You would think it was a life or death situation. Kind of like Gehazi, how Gehazi's running after Naaman. Naaman has to ask Gehazi, is all well here? And he said, all, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go when they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elijah said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. He's telling a lot of lies here. Let God be true with every man a liar. And he said unto him, Went not my heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maidservants? Elijah wasn't in this thing for what he could get out of it. And he's upset with Gehazi because he's in this for what he can get out of it. Just like Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 8 and 9, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable unto any of you. You see, Paul wasn't in this thing for what he could get. Elijah wasn't in this for what he could get. But Gehazi ran after Naaman and got some things from him and lied to get it. So look what happens in 2 Kings 5.27. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Look at that. Gehazi is now a leper himself. What if the Lord allowed all these sicknesses and diseases and infirmities and things like this to infect the TV preachers that took the money from the old people that watch their shows or the people that's got sicknesses and diseases? What if the Lord allowed those same diseases to come back onto those TV preachers for taking those people's money? That would be something.